we're fast approaching the point in our program where we talk to our, our students and hear about their projects. In addition to the engineering aspects of the, uh, the projects that the dean mentioned earlier, the senior projects you'll hear about provide invaluable experiences in project management, entrepreneurship, leadership, social responsibility, and team building. Applying classroom learning to solve real world problems is something our students do very well and often. This year's Senior Design Date Symposium and Showcase features great examples of innovation and experience-based learning at its best. Thank you all for being here to celebrate the achievements of the next class of UCF engineers. And if you talk to those students, I bet every one of them can tell you where they'll be 20 days from now. They'll be at the UCF arena receiving their diplomas. So this is one of our last chances to see what they have to say and what they've learned here at UCF. So thank you all for being a part of that. Before we begin those student project presentations, I do want to acknowledge the faculty who support our students in their senior design courses. Their names have appeared on the screen earlier. For those uh, faculty members who are in attendance who I cannot see with these lights, I, I would like to ask you to stand right now to be recognized. On behalf of Dean Suman, our college leadership, your faculty colleagues, and most importantly, our students, thank you very much for your dedication, your selflessness, and your guidance. Kudos for a job well done. There's one more thing I'd like to do before we begin our, our actual presentations. There are a number of staff members throughout our college who've done a, a lot of work behind the scenes to make all this come together today. And very briefly, I just want to mention a few of those, and I apologize to any that we, we leave out. Siobhan Binder, Deb Williams, Jamie Larson, Jody Peters, John Van Dusen, Kimberly Lewis, Robert Weston, Pete Alferis, Sarah Dillon, Robin Knight, Tim Kotner, Matt Rowhouse, and Bob Rich, who when this all started, had a full head of dark hair. <laughs> he looks a little different today. But it's, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, ask our first student presenting team to come forward and, and share their presentation with us. This is the existing vehicle electrification. Please step forward. All right, good morning. My name is Ryan Puente, and our project was the existing vehicle electrification. Our project overview for the current project is to create a prototype platform to test different motors, controllers, and support systems with the final design goal of producing an electric conversion that targets a large fleet of vehicles. Now, why not a, uh, convert to a hybrid, you ask? Well, first, there's just too many parts required. Uh, hybrids require an engine, electric motor, transmission, and battery pack, where the electric uh, conversion only uh, requires the motor and the pack. There's just not enough savings in fuel. The typical sedan usually uh, gets about 19 cents per mile. The uh, hybrid is about 10 cents per mile. An electric vehicle is about five cents per mile. And it's not an easy conversion. There are multiple interfaces required with both mechanical and electrical uh, parts that's not for the do-it-yourselfer. Now, what to do with that broken car? First, you can repair it. Depending on the repairs, it's gonna cost between two to $6,000. You can trade it in, and depending on the car you're trading in, it's gonna cost between five and 40,000. Or you can convert it to a, a fully electric vehicle which can cost between four and $15,000. Now this blue area is uh, what we're targeting. We wanna target people with the broken cars that are looking at repairing or trading it in, and uh, we wanna show them the uh, possibilities of converting it to fully electric. Now our final design requirements for cost, we wanted the motor mounts and adapters to be less than $5,000. We wanted to integrate production electric vehicle safety features into our safety requirements. We wanted to maintain converted vehicle's original performance numbers. We did not want to reduce the reliability of the original vehicle. We wanted it to be uh, very serviceable, um, no really special service requirements involved. And we wanted it to be installed within three to five days with uh, regular hand tools or through an installer network. And the chassis selection we chose is the Ford Fox and SN95 chassis, which is used in 13 different models from 79 to 04. And the conversions can be easily adapted to most vehicles. And for um, just to give you a number 
For the Mustangs from 79 to 04, they are roughly about 4 million pro um, produced. So that gives us our large uh, vehicle line that we wanted to target. Good morning. My name is Thomas Entman. I will be going over some of the uh, Prototech details. Uh, first, we selected an air-cooled air DC-type motor. And here's a picture of our motor right here. It is a GE industrial style motor. Um, this particular one was modified for EV use. The brush life is approximately 70,000 miles. Um, it's air cooled for simplicity. We don't have coolant lines running to the motor. It actually has an increased size um, fan in it. Um, it is tested to 10,000 RPM by the manufacturer for a rotor burst. It actually has re more retaining rings than the standard industrial motor. You could actually go off the shelf and buy a standard industrial motor for any of these conversions, and that would probably cut the cost in half of the motor. Um, we used a, an isolated gate bipolar transistor type speed controller. Basically, for our, our application, it is the most efficient available. Here is a picture of it. Um, it's capable of a 1,000 amp control. It has onboard self-diagnostic. It can output to check engine light, low fuel light. It can be easily integrated with the existing vehicle's instrument cluster. It has dual processors. Uh, if one processor senses that the other one is asking the car to do something that it didn't want, it'll shut down and set a code. It uses a uh, Hall Effect type gas pedal, which means I don't have a potentiometer box. There's no mechanical linkage used. It's like your modern fly-by-wire system. And as I said, it has multiple warning outputs. Um, we decided to go with a clutchless type adapter between the transmission and the motor. That way there's uh, less parts to fail. And again, we're going to reuse the factory transmission, and no clutch is required. And the actual hub that adapts to the motor incorpor incorporates a clamp style and a keyway. Here's a picture of our uh, steel hub that we use. This goes on the output shaft of the motor. As you can see, it uses a keyway, but it also clamps on. That way, not all the load is going through the keyway itself. This is actually our stock for our different adapters and spacers that we had. And we actually pinned all these pieces together first with roll pins before the center lines were drilled, so we made sure their alignment was proper. <coughs> this is the clutch disc adapter that goes onto the steel hub. Again, this is us drilling the uh, holes in the adapter plate for the transmission. This is uh, the spacer and the adapter plate mounted to the motor. And again, the steel hub. I'll go through more of these pictures here. And this is the final, this is the clutch disc actually bolted together. Now, you won't see this on our project if you go out to the car because it is actually in the bell housing of the transmission. This is the completed motor to manual transmission assembly, it's us installing it in the car. And this is what it finally looks like when it's completed. Now, we went to, with a DC to DC converter. We would have had the option to run a belt drive to run an alternator because we do have to keep the 12 volt. Um, system vehicle charged. Um, if you run a belt drive, you have some mechanical losses. We decided to bypass all that and we went strictly with a electrical converter that steps down the voltage from 144 volts down to 12 volts. AGM style batteries, we decided to go with lead acid batteries due to uh, budget cost. But we did use a, uh, AGM stands for absorbed glass mat, which does not have any free floating liquid in the battery. So if it gets cracked, it doesn't spill. And we went with an onboard charger. The charger on our car can plug into a 120 volt standard socket or it can use 220 single phase. It's, it works with any charge point charger. You can get, download an app on your phone, find all the charge point chargers in the local area. We can plug it into the solar charger that's in the student parking lot. It basically lets us charge anywhere. For our safety integration, as we touched one of our design goals was to integrate OEM safety into it. We have redundant high voltage contactor circuits. The uh, contactor is mainly what connects and disconnects the high voltage pack in the car. And one of our contactors is run off the key and the other one is controlled by the controller. So if one of them fails and sticks open or sticks closed, we can actually disconnect it just by turning the key off. The high voltage system is isolated from the chassis. That means none of the wires are actually grounded to the chassis. If one wire were to uh, rub out somewhere on the chassis, it wouldn't electrify the frame. If both of them rub out, we do have a high, a fast blow, high voltage fuse. We actually integrated an inertia switch into the car that disconnects the battery in the event of a uh, collision. All our cables are marked in orange. If you pop the hood on your electric vehicle or your hybrid today, you'll see all your high voltage cables are marked in orange. And we also integrated a high voltage disconnect. This is a picture of our electronics tray before it goes in the trunk. 
You see the uh, red item is actually the, high, the uh, manual <coughs> disconnect. The silver box is the DC to DC converter. Then you have the charger in black and the two high voltage contactors. A little quick information on batteries. The typical batteries used for electric conversions are lead acid, the flooded type, which are, they're okay, they're cheap, but they do have the issue of leaking acid if you're in an accident or if they do become cracked for any, any reason. Lithium ion, these lithium ions would use, typically use a cobalt oxide as your positive electrode. They do suffer from the risk of explosion at high discharge rates or when the packs get low. Uh, lead acid AGM, which is what we used, they are pretty much spill proof. They don't gas when they're being charged or at high loads. The other option we had was a lithium iron phosphate battery, which <coughs> is similar to the lithium ion battery, except it uses a, um, a, a highly doped iron for the uh, positive electrode. And one of the good points about that is it does not suffer from the uh, high heat generation and or the possibility of explosion as the lithium irons do. Cost is going to run you probably $197 per kilowatt hour for AGM batteries or $750 per kilowatt hour for uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries. Weight, it's a trade off. You need 65 pounds per kilowatt hour for the AGM battery or 21 pounds per kilowatt hour for a uh, life battery. And it's, going to and it's going to take probably about 20 kilowatt hours to go 70 to 80 miles in range. Our prototype performance, we estimate with the pack that's in there, it's an eight kilowatt hour pack. We'll probably get 30 miles out of it, anywhere from 25 to 30 miles out with the current batteries. If we put a, if we used all the room we had in the car with lithium iron phosphate, we could probably get 150 miles. Quarter mile acceleration times on the installed batteries, we ran a 19.6 at 65 miles an hour. We actually took it to the local drag strip to get these performance numbers. <laughs> If we used the same battery pack but in lithium iron phosphate, we would have run a 17.2 at 77 miles an hour. The stock 86 Thunderbird with the V8 quarter mile time is a 19.5 at 67 miles an hour. And the stock 86 Thunderbird Turbo Coupe is 17.1. So we maintained the stock performance numbers of the car. If you see, here's an actual video of us at the track. We, when we come off the line, you can see the instant torque of the motor, and then the battery pack sags pretty good near the uh, middle of the track, not, in a lot, not allowing the car to accelerate anymore. It's, it was down near 100 volts at the high discharge rate. So like I said, if we switched to a lithium ion pack, the battery voltage would have stayed up higher. So our final cost of the prototype, our target was less than 5,000 because typically online nowadays you can find universal adapters, but those kits cost about $5,000. Our actual final cost ended up being $900 for all the metal. Uh, total cost of the functioning car was $8,300, and that included $1,200 worth of specialty tools we needed for crimping cables and welding, so we wouldn't pass that on to the customer once our final conversion kits are completed. And so our total for a functioning car was about $7,100. And I would like to thank Parkus Energy for sponsoring our project, and we also had an anonymous, anonymous investor that gave us the rest of the money to complete it. Um, good morning again, and I want to thank everyone for being here. My name is Ernest Davidson, and the title of our project is the Soji Emergency Response Unit, which we call the SURU. Um, our mentor is Michael Pepper, and he's from Advanced Power Electronics Corporation. Um, so recently, modern warfare has begun to take place in more urban areas, and these urban areas provide more distractions and increased dangers. And one of these dangers is an IED, which is an improvised explosive device. Um, an example of this could be either a car bomb or even a suicide bomber. In 2010, 14,661 IED events occurred, which left 3,360 soldiers injured and 268 dead. Um, when confronted with this challenge, our group decided that decreasing the emergency response time could be the difference between the life and the death of a soldier. So before I um, go into details, we want to give you a quick overview of the project. Um, as we can see, there are accelerometers and temperature sensors in the soldier's helmet. Um, this information will then be sent to the microcontroller unit, which will be on the soldier's hip. Um, also, we have a heart rate monitor and a GPS um, on the soldier, which will also communicate with the unit on the soldier's hip. And then this data will be wirelessly communicated to the Android tablet, which will be held by one of the Army's medical staff. So in the event that an IED does occur and the soldier is injured, um, the medical staff can quickly and efficiently um, dispatch help to the soldier. Um, the goal of our project was not to detect IEDs or prevent them. They were more for the preserving of life of the soldier. Um, so here are some of the specifications for our project. 
Um, we want the input voltage range to be between 7 and 30 volts, so the soldier could use any uh, power supply or source that he could find. Um, also, check the vitals of the soldier every five seconds and whenever a threshold is broken. Um, it needs to be able to monitor the temperature range between 20 and 45 degrees Celsius. We can measure the impact up to 50 um, Gs. Um, it tracks the soldier within five meters precision every second. And it can communicate wirelessly with the Android tablet up to 60 meters. Um, so some of the details about our project, um, starting with the heart rate measuring. Um, for the heart rate measuring, we use the Polar RMC-01 receiver and the Polar transmitter belt. Um, as you can see in the bottom right hand of the screen, um, the transmitter belt goes around the soldier's chest, and this wirelessly transmits the data to the unit on the soldier's hip. Um, so each pulse that the belt measures, the receiver on the board on the soldier's hip would send out a pulse. And after a minute, we calculate how many pulses have been sent, and we use this to calculate the soldier's uh, beats per minute. Uh, good morning. My name is Kevin Shelton, and I'll be going over the some of the other serial components. One of them is the GPS, which we will use to constantly be tracking the soldier in order to figure out where he is at any given time in case uh, the IED does go off, and we need to send a response team to that soldier immediately. And when we were looking at the GPS, we wanted some a GPS that was very accurate, and we wanted to have it constantly be updating the soldier's location with a good baud rate or the amount of data that is sent to the microcontroller, uh, and which will then be sent to the tablet. And of course, with most GPSs are very high power consumption. We need a low power consumption because the soldier would be out in the field all day. All right, and next I'll go over some of the wireless communication that we used, and we chose to use a, uh, an XB24AWI001, which is a wireless communication device that uses a Zigbee protocol. Um, and as I said, the wireless communication we used is to communicate with the tablet, with the microcontroller, so this will uh, send data to the tablet, which will show the soldier's health at that given moment of time. Um, and the outdoor range for our wireless communication is about 90 meters and an indoor range of 30 meters. And here's what the microcontroller is constantly doing when um, we have the soldier out. It's constantly checking his heart rate and, and if there's an impact. And if uh, the helmet does detect an impact, then it checks the threshold to see if it's a concussion level force or it could injure the soldier in any way or form. And if it is, then it will send an alert with the GPS coordinates of the soldier immediately to the tablet to alert the local medical uh, person or the leader who's in charge of keeping track and sending people to uh, the soldier immediately. Otherwise, it'll just keep checking the heart rate and the accelerometers until about 10 seconds or so where it will get all the data, the temperature, the heart rate, and the GPS location of the soldier and send that to the tablet. So now that we have all these devices, how are we going to actually power up the whole system? And first of all, we wanted to make it um, energy efficient, so we put a solar panel, a photovoltaic solar panel, and a rechargeable battery. The soldier already has a rechargeable battery, and so we wanted to make it so the battery can last longer. We added the photovoltaic solar panel. We wanted a portable, rollable, and it's lightweight and reliable one. As you can see here for the solar panel, um, we had originally had three options the crystalline family or the thin film. We chose the thin film because it's lightweight, it's flexible, and even if it gets punctures, it continues to operate, and it can handle rough condition, which is needed for soldiers. Even though it's less efficient, but it matches all the requirements. As you can see here, this is the um, solar panel. It's flexible and rollable, so they can e a soldier can easily store it if it's not needed. From the blue line, the power curve, we can, we can see that it, it, this solar panel gives out around 7.6 watts, and from the red curve, it, this is about 15 volts and 480 milliamps, which is more than needed for our current device. Um, as for the battery, we have a lithium ion battery. The soldier already have this on them, so we can actually just plug it in and they continue to operate. And this is the battery. We have a 12 and 24 volts. We actually need the 12 volts, so we actually have an extended battery life. But how are we going to switch between the two power sources? And we have the diode O-ring circuit. It's a very simple circuit, just the two power supplies and two diodes. And um, let's say the sun is out, everything is good. The soldier is going to use the solar panel. But as soon as the sun goes down, it, the, the system automatically switches to the battery. And the battery is going to be the main power for the device. But if the sun comes back out, it automatically changes again to the solar panel. Good morning. Uh, I'm Brian Eaton. Uh, I'll be talking about how the tablet interacts with all of this. Um, so the tablet will be plugged into this device, the IOIO for Android, and this comes with a software development kit, so we could program the application to communicate with this. 
and it's powered um, separately from the tablet, anywhere from five volts to 15 volts. So we're using a nine volt battery to power this, and it can power the uh, XB device that will be receiving the data on there uh, because it's got an output voltage of 3.3 volts, which is what the XB um, receives. Uh, it's got a USB interface, so it plugs right into the Android tablet, and it's got uh, 48 I.O. pins that we can use. Um, we're just using uh, a couple to use the XB device. It's also got Bluetooth capabilities if in the future we wanted to uh, make it communicate with the tablet over Bluetooth. Um, so here's how the tablet application works. Uh, that's a picture of it in the top right. Uh, so basically it's continually listening and receiving data from the IOIO for Android device. It processes all the data and when it's processing the data, it first checks to see if there was, there was an alert sent with the information that it, that it received. If there was, we want to immediately run the emergency function, which will uh, display a warning on the screen and update the map with the GPS location of the soldier. If there wasn't an alert sent, then we just receive all the data normally, which means we read in the GPS, the heart rate, and the temperature. And uh, when we read in the GPS, we show the location on the map of the application, and then we simply display the heart rate and the temperature in the application. Here's a video of our project. So when you hit the soldier, the warning comes up, updates the map, and then it'll continually uh, go back to updating with the current um, heart rate and the temperature. So in summary, that is the SEER device. Uh, the challenge was to decrease the emergency response time for rescuing injured soldiers, and our solution was SIRU, Soldier Emergency Response Unit. Um, we continually monitor the vitals of the soldier and detect life-threatening impacts to the head and track the location of the soldier in the field. And the value of this project is to hopefully preserve lives of soldiers in the field and return them safely home to their loved ones. And that is our project, and we will be right out in, in the atrium. We'll be demoing it all morning if you want to come and stop by. So thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Isaac Lima, and we are the UCF team for the ASHRAE competition this year. As some of you may know, ASHRAE is the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers. And this, this society creates and publishes guidelines and standards for government agencies, architects, and engineers. ASHRAE has over 50,000 members today, and it is an international organization that not only influences the Department of Energy, but also U.S. building codes. And ASHRAE is all about sustainability. Every year, ASHRAE puts together uh, annual competition for students in order to encourage these students to become more involved in the engineering profession that is crucial to ensuring a sustainable future for buildings. The goal of the competition is to design an energy efficient HVAC system for a specific building. Every year, ASHRAE picks a different building to be analyzed and designed. The competition has teams from diff different universities throughout the country, including Purdue, Cal Poly, Penn State, Kansas State. These universities have HVAC programs that are very prestigious and UCF has actually done pretty well over the past uh, three years, as you can see. And that, is, that speaks a lot for you know, what our college has, has progressed over a short amount of time, and also for our uh, technical advisors in the, the local Central Florida professional chapter of ASHRAE. It's one of the best chapters in the, in the country, and uh, they provide a lot of good technical advising that help us uh, compete in this competition. This year's competition building is the Joe Enrico Mensueto Library. As you can see there, it's a very unique design. This university library is uh, obviously located at the University of Chicago. And it's one of six libraries. And as some of you may know, University of Chicago is a very prestigious university, worldwide renowned. And the elliptical glass dome makes it a very unique design. Also, there's an underground vault with 50 foot high cranes that automatically retrieve the books and artifacts, and that can hold up to 3.5 million volumes. The construction cost was roughly about $68 million, and the building area is a little less than 60,000 square feet. Now the competition goals 
like I mentioned before, um, you know, we have to properly calculate the heating and cooling loads of the building and then size the HVAC system and equipment for energy efficiency as well as to meet ASHRAE standards for comfort, ventilation, and efficiency. Good morning, my name is Kyle Inge and Isaac uh, began talking about the building. I'm gonna discuss um, how we began to address some of those challenges. At the beginning of the competition, we were basically given three PDF floor plans for each of the major levels for the building and that's all we were supplied. Um, this building was designed by an architect by the name of Helmut Jan. He was actually named one of the 10 most influential living American architects. Uh, he is based out of Chicago and has won uh, numerous awards. So because of the, the prestige of the building, we weren't given a lot of the actual floor plans and construction documents because they use similar processes in their other buildings. So to address this, we actually harness what is called building information modeling. It is essentially 3D CAD but we can also add information into our model um, and create a, a knowledgeable 3D model of the building. I can, I can you know, click a glass panel and say, how much glass do we have in this building? And it will tell me that that glass dome is roughly 30,000 square feet of glass. So over the course of mostly the fall semester, we began to build up the architectural model. What you're gonna see are pictures of the actual library side by side with the pictures of our uh, BIM model. It was very important that we use this because the architects had some specific requests that were unique to this year. Um, we must maintain the architectural integrity of the building and, and respect the architect's design intent. And for that reason, we were not allowed to put any equipment outside of the building or attach it to the exterior of the building. Um, so BIM really allowed us to 3D visualize our design and make sure we weren't obstructing any uh, you know, uh, viewpoints or lines of sight, or just installing an equipment that might somehow change the way people interact with the building as they go through their daily routine. Good morning, I'm Bradley Hughes. Uh, and as we got on with our HVAC design and our building architecture was already complete, uh, one of the first main challenges we were tasked with for the HVAC design was load calculations. Um, it's important to do these load calculations to properly size our HVAC equipment. When I, when I say load, I mean heating and cooling load, how much heat we either need to apply to the building or take away from the building, whether it be the winter or summer. Obviously, these heating and cooling loads are heavily dependent on the climate that the building is placed in. Uh, as we know, Chicago has really harsh winters, and it also has a really hot and humid climate, seeing as it's on the shore of one of our nation's Great Lakes. Um, so we use software that has stored uh, data about the uh, city of Chicago's weather patterns, and uh, we use that to aid us in this process. Uh, as you can see below, there are two pie charts. Um, one is of the cooling load and one is of the heating load. It says July for the cooling load, and that's because we use the, the most extreme days of the year to size our equipment and do these load calculations. Um, obviously, we don't want it to be the hottest day of the year and the HVAC system fail. Um, these pie charts are, are what compromises or what the loads are compiled of. Um, as you can see, all that beautiful glass and architectural design uh, is the major part of our loads that we have to meet. Uh, you also want to may take note the ventilation load is the next largest chunk, and we'll talk about that and how we tried to address that and save energy in that aspect. Uh, zoning was the next process. Zoning actually kind of breaks up our building uh, and makes it multiple little subclimates within our building. It's not just one large climate. Uh, each zone can then be controlled on its own. It can have different temperatures, different humidities, uh, be controlled differently. They're each controlled by their own thermostat. Uh, you can have different air flows going into different zones. You can, like the, the slide says, you can heat one zone and cool an adjacent zone. So we use this zoning techniques because different parts of the building, uh, they have different load profiles and have different heating loads or cooling loads at different parts of the day than the other zones. And they're also, the different parts of the building are, are used for different purposes. And uh, I mean, if you have people up running around or work, working or um, you might want the temperature to be cooler or if there's also a pre preservation apartment in the library and that required stricter indoor air quality conditions. So we can control all those things by separating the building. The, the air distribution system is the way we transport air from our HVAC equipment to our actual zones that I just mentioned. Um, the blue supply ducts take the air from the equipment that's already being conditioned and put it into the spaces that we're trying to condition. The red ducts, however, take the 
air from the spaces and take them back to the HVAC equipment to either be exhausted from the building or to be recirculated and reconditioned. The yellow uh, shows the HVAC equipment. We actually had a pretty uh, tough time uh, designing this ductwork uh, because we had very little space to do this. Um, the archive vault is 55 feet tall, but the, the books are stacked up 50 feet into the uh, vault. So we had a five foot vertical space to run all of our ducts. And that may sound like a lot of space, but we had to run all of our ducts for all three levels of the building, the ground floor, which contains the offices, the mezzanine level, which has all the mechanical rooms and all the server rooms, and also the vault itself. Uh, so this is where the 3D modeling that, that Kyle talked about earlier really came into effect. And we could collaborate because um, we had six different air handlers trying to feed three different levels of the building. As Brad said, once we, we got our distribution system in place, we then began to really look at, at what type of equipment we were going to select to do the, the heating and cooling of our air. Um, you'll see a list on there. Um, many of the, the systems we chose are, are common systems. Um, we didn't really reinvent the wheel. Um, one, just for, for cost, and, and two, because we wanted it to be something that was easily, easy to maintain. So many of these systems you could find examples of in, in any of the buildings here at UCF or in any you know, college campus. Um, but one of the unique energy saving features that we put in our system was what was known as a dedicated outdoor air system with an energy recovery ventilator. And, and basically what that is is in any commercial or industrial building, you're required to bring in so much fresh air uh, to maintain indoor air quality, such as CO2 levels and, and particulate levels, and exhaust so much air to remove those harmful things um, out of the environment. So. The problem is, is when you bring that outdoor air in, it's either you know, generally hot and humid during the summer or very cold and dry during the winter, and, and your equipment has to work to bring that, that air to, to the room condition that you want. So rather than duct all that air independently to all six air handlers, we send it all through one air handler, which does the bulk of the um, heating or cooling and dehumidification of the air. One of the things we added to that system was what was called the energy recovery ventilator. And basically what it does is, is as the exhaust air is exiting the building, we've already paid and, and spent the energy to condition that air. And it's, it's either cooled or heated depending on the season. So what the energy recovery ventilator does is it's basically a heat exchanger that takes some of the heat either out of the intake or, or, or exiting stream um, and, and transfers it to that outdoor air coming in. So essentially we can, we can precondition that air before it gets to the unit, which helps reduce load on the outdoor air system which has an, a greater downstream effect of reducing the load on the individual systems that control the various parts of our building. Another added value thing we, we did for our project is, is we really wanted to have the full experience of senior design. I know when I talk to a lot of engineers around town, I can ask them, what did you do for your senior design project? And they can tell me you know, exactly what they built. So we wanted to be able to build a physical prototype. And we certainly couldn't build our entire HVAC system. So we built a remote climate sensor, which is just sort of a value added uh, to our project. It um, has an LCD screen, and it measures the temperature and humidity of whatever uh, room it's in. It also has an LED warning light, which changes colors depending on if we get out of the favorable zone. And one neat feature we added to it is it's actually internet uh, connected. So right now we have it set up to where it updates every five minutes to a Twitter account online. And you can actually follow it on Twitter. And it will tell you the temperature and humidity of whatever room we have it in, as long as it's plugged into a, an Ethernet cable. We were able to do this for roughly a, a, almost a fourth of the cost of other commercial models that we uh, found. And it could easily be integrated into the larger building's in, uh, energy management system to help monitor the conditions in the vault area, uh, which have to remain relatively constant all year long. So as you can see, we uh, did a life cycle cost of a period of 25 years. And when you see in uh, the first year, the initial cost includes you know, such um, costs as labor, installing the equipment, the cost of the equipment, and all that good stuff. And it's roughly about $3.8 $3 million just for the HVAC system um, for, this, for this building, the, the proposed design that we came up with that we've been discussing. And the baseline, the minimum uh, code system uh, dictated by ASHRAE, is the, the, the other line, the, the darker red line. And that, as you can see, that has a higher maintenance and utility rate, which is why the life cycle cost of it goes up higher. And after a little over three years, the, our, our proposed design actually pays itself back. And uh, 
you know, over a 25 year period, we have a savings of roughly $5.5 million. Overall, the team believes that we met the competition requirements as well as the owner requirements and not only by, by designing an HVC system that is cost effective and can pay itself back with a reasonable amount of time, but we've also designed an energy efficient system that you know, can propel the building to a more sustainable future. Uh, we have, uh, for more information, if you'd like to learn more about uh, our project, more technical aspects to it, please come see us at our booth. Uh, special thanks to all the local technical advisors. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Carlos Velez. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Central Florida. And I'm going to be introducing uh, two projects entitled the Abandoned Oil Well Monitoring System and the Methane Hydrate Extraction, um, comprising of three teams, one team for the Abandoned Oil Well and two for Methane Hydrate Extraction. Um, before I introduce the teams, I want to talk a little bit about the history of this project because it started right here. Uh, exactly two years ago, um, when I was presenting my own uh, senior design project at the second annual showcase, um, Mark Blue, uh, who's here today, a Harris Corporate uh, representative, was walking the aisles just looking at presentations, and I met him. And uh, just based on this encounter, uh, we started to do some work. And that, that coming year, uh, th this encounter led to four senior design teams uh, funded $10,000 by Harris, and we were able to get a half-match grant um, by the Florida Energy System Consortium. Uh, the next year, um, uh, the third annual showcase, those four teams presented, and then this led to an additional three new projects, an additional 10K, and on top of that, we were able to get a full match grant from the Florida High Tech Corridor uh, this year, uh, so that's an additional 10K. So just to go to show uh, the effectiveness of these showcases, uh, two years ago, um, we, just had a, uh, we just met, and now we have $45,000 funding, seven projects, um, and all the students that got uh, jobs after these projects. Uh, currently, I don't know what the funding will be for uh, next year, hopefully, I, I, hopefully big, um, because we have proposed, uh, we submitted a proposal to the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, which is a, a joint grant offered by the government and uh, BP, um, to address some of the environmental issues currently ha occurring in the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. So we already submitted this, and we don't hear back until June 2nd, but if we do g get it, it's an extra 800K onto this project. So I think uh, Dr. Um, uh, Arvisu was asked a really good question. He said, um, how do the students kind of uh, use their innovation and hard work to get uh, into the market? So this is a great example. You need industrial support and you need academic support, but more importantly, you need showcases like this where the two can be merged. Okay, this is the only place where the academic support and the industrial support can meet with the students and just showing in this progress, this is how you get from small projects to senior designs to full government grants. So to briefly describe the two projects, um, both of them address uh, major environmental concerns and energy concerns uh, with the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, first being uh, oil. Uh, we've been drill drilling in the Gulf of Mexico uh, since the 20s, and eventually when you uh, drill a well and you suck all the oil out of it, there's a point where it gets too deep and they abandon the well. It's, it's, too, it's not cost effective to extract oil from a well anymore. So the well is abandoned and just left at that depth, and you think they've been doing this since the 40s. So we have wells, um, I'll, leave, I'll leave the number of how many there are, it's a shocking number, I'll, I'll leave it to the team to, to deliver that. But we have wells existing in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, over a, a thousand meters in depth, in a corrosive, high pressure environment, existing there for almost 80 years, there are going to be incidences, okay, guaranteed. So what we propose is a monitoring system, a cap placed on the oil well, that can test and see uh, the, the structural stability and also to see if there are any oil leaks. This way we can detect um, uh, wells that have not been uh, abandoned uh, correctly, or also wells that may have been leaking that we don't even know uh, what their condition they, they lie in. Uh, the second uh, energy and environmental concern in the Gulf of Mexico is methane hydrate. Uh, a lot of people maybe don't know what methane hydrate is. All it is is it's ice methane. And there are massive, massive sediments that exist um, under the seafloor uh, throughout the world, but very concentrated in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this uh, provides a huge energy source, but also can act as a very uh, ticking time bomb. Uh, everyone knows methane burns very cleanly, but if methane just goes into the atmosphere, it can produce uh, much higher greenhouse gases uh, when compared to CO2. So if any of these sediments were to come off from the ocean floor, they would rise to the top surface, melt before then, and come out as methane gas, in which we'd have a massive, massive problem um, with the environment. So these teams try to study how to extract the methane from the ocean floor, which methods are more efficient, and which are, are safer. 
So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce the first team for uh, methane uh, hydrate extraction. Good morning. My name is Sean Feschek, and today I'll be presenting to you our method of extracting methane gas from methane hydrate. The reason for this is because a secure supply of natural gas is vital for the U.S. national energy policy because natural gas is the cleanest and most widely used of all fossil fuels. The technological challenge, however, is that producing methane gas from methane hydrate is currently not in the energy or the energy industry's interest. So our goal is to produce a safe, efficient method of extracting methane gas from methane hydrate. This will be done by creating a small laboratory scale experiment that mimics the conditions found in the hydrate layer in the Gulf of Mexico. So our experiment is to produce the methane gas or the methane hydrate and show the efficiency of our method. So from the picture on the left, uh, the location of the methane hydrate can be seen in dark blue. It surrounds all the coastlines. And there is roughly 700,000 trillion cubic feet of methane hydrate in which 200,000 trillion cubic feet of methane hydrate is located within the United States. Such high numbers have sparked the interest of many other countries. Also, each volume of solid gas hydrate contains 164 cubic feet of methane gas. Uh, so basically, these hydrates can be considered uh, concentrated forms of natural gas. Uh, this means there's a very large amount of this virtually untapped uh, energy source to be used. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sean McGinn. Um, basically, the, uh, the good aspects of methane and methane hydrate is that methane is a, uh, has the lowest CO2 emissions per unit of heat energy of all the fossil fuels. Um, and it is a, uh, it comes, there's three crystal structures, which is in which I'll go over later, but basically um, Japan has been in this process of looking for methane hydrate and testing it and making it commercially viable for a while now, mostly because they have, they're kind of isolated at the import all their all their oil, all their energy, they're very dependent on offshore oil, and plus with the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, which they relied a lot on nuclear energy, now that's kind of been compromised, so they're looking for an alternate energy source. Um, basically, one of the ways to locate where this methane hydrate is located on the uh, bottom of the ocean floor is through BSRs, which are bottom simulating reflectors, which it marks a transition in the velocity of reflected sound waves as they pass through the icy gas hydrates with the free gas, free hydrate or free methane gas. The problem is they're notoriously unreliable. Um, there's been places where they found a lot of BSRs and no hydrate, and there's been places where they found a lot of hydrate and there was no, no BSRs. So locating the hydrate in high, high concentrations is one of the obstacles or hurdles we have to get through. Um, we, the United States passed the Methane Hydrate R&D Act in 2000. However, by 1998, uh, Japan had already done their first test drill in Canada, the Malik, uh, Malik site, which is a proof of concept uh, well. And um, as you can see, Japan and India outspend us by a tremendous amount as far as methane hydrate R&D, um, about 10 to 1 as far as Japan and the United States. So it become basically competitive with them and to step up our R&D, we need to start spending a lot more. We only increased our budget from 12 million in 2006. From 2001 to 2005, it was 9 million for the entire methane R&D budget. Um, now to form the methane hydrate, um, the animation you'll see is actually the formation on the atomic level of the crystal structure, where you'll see the methane being trapped in a crystal lattice structure of, of water, basically, which why it turns into ice. Um, you can see it's under very high pressure and low temperature. The higher pressure you use, you can kind of go up to higher temperature to form that hydrate. Um, it still is extremely low, between zero and about 10, 12 degrees Celsius. Um, for our project, we're going to use probably around 140 atmospheres, which translates to about 2,000 PSI or 12 megapascals. Um, so we're going to be in between 1,500 and 2,000 PSI and zero to five degrees Celsius. Um, they come in three crystal structures, all of which at standard temperature and pressure. 
expand to 164 meters cube or cubic feet of methane gas as well. All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Davis. Um, currently, there are three uh, extraction methods that are being researched and employed in the field, the first of which is known as the depressurization method. With this method, a uh, hole is drilled into the hydrate layer, which causes a pressure drop in the layer, which reduces the methane gas and uh, flows upward through a tube. Now, this uh, method is known as the most cost effective, but can, uh, has shown to plateau with gas production over time and can cause submarine landslides, which are a major uh, detriment to the environment. The second method is known as thermal injection. With this method, uh, hot water is pumped down into the hydrate layer, which causes a dissociation between the methane gas and the hydrate. This allows for the gas to be collected. Um, and now this method is known as the most costly and least efficient method at the moment. The third method, carbon dioxide injection, has not been done in the field yet. Um, this method is similar to that of the thermal injection method where carbon dioxide is pumped into the hydrate layer and this causes the dissociation between the methane hydrate and the methane gas and uh, allows for the gas to be collected as well. Now for our approach, uh, we decided to do a combination between the depressurization and thermal injection methods. We found that when in conjunction, these methods actually will supplement each other and uh, causing the, allowing for the uh, most gas to be collected while retaining high efficiency. Hello, I'm Matthew Wimpsa. I'm going to be talking about our design on this slide. Um, our design is going to be housed inside a freezer with dry ice, which will simulate the low temperature found at the bottom of the ocean. But the main piece of our design is this hydraulic cylinder here. And underneath the piston, there will, is where the water and the methane will be housed. And what we decided to do is have a jack push on the piston to in turn create the high pressure, which will then create the methane hydrates. Then at the bottom here, we'll have our pressure sensor along with thermal wells, which will house our temperature sensors, as well as a heating coil, which will simulate the thermal injection part of our method. Then outside the bottom of the cylinder, we will also have hydraulic hoses and a valve here, which will act as a pressure release to in turn add the depressurization part of our method. And as you see here, we have a second hydraulic hose, which will go into a graduating cylinder, which will both be able to collect the methane gas and then tell us how much we collected. And then this here is the fixture part of our design. Well, what's special about the fixture is that's the it's one piece that was completely built by our team from scratch. And it's made of A36 steel. And we designed it with the parameter it needs to be, we'll be able to withstand about 2,800 pounds of force. To the left here, you'll see a simulation done in Pro E at, you know, at the you know, zero degree Celsius environment with the 2,800 pounds of force acting on it. And according to Pro E, the maximum amount of stress on that design is about 20,000 PSI, which gives it a factor safety of about two and a half, which overall makes it a very safe, simple, workable design. All right, good morning. My name is Lauren Cavett. Uh, for our budget, we were allotted uh, $3,000 thanks to Harris Corporation. And we were actually under budget, saving around uh, $800. So to summarize uh, our project, there is a need for energy independence in the United States. We have large deposits of methane hydrate um, around uh, the Gulf of Mexico, um, as you can see the area highlighted. Uh, so right here in our own backyard, we have a potential long-range domestic resource. Um, and to simulate, uh, to extract, the, extract this, um, uh, methane. We simulated methane gas extraction uh, through various uh, methods that we researched, um, combining the um, depressurization and thermal uh, injection to be the most innovative approach. Um, for our prototype, uh, we will form the methane hydrate, um, extract the gas, and uh, compare the efficiency of our method. All right, and um, we would just like to share our special thanks uh, from Harris, uh, Progress Energy, um, Mark Blue, and Sky Ayers, um, along with Carlos Velez, Dr. Marcel Illy, and um, the UCF Machine Shop.
Thanks, Carlos. Uh, as he mentioned, we are phase two of the abandoned oil well monitoring system. And uh, I'm Ben Thomas, the team lead, and I'm going to in introduce my, my team members. We've got Greg, who's here, and Thomas is out at, at the booth. Uh, that's me and Dan Warner out of the booth, and then Kevin and Chris Scott, who's also out of the booth. Kevin's going to tell you a little bit about the problem that Carlos began to began to tell you about at the beginning of uh, in his presentation and explain uh, what's going on. I'm going to tell you the solution, and Greg's going to tell you how we're going to do it. So. All right, good morning. My name is Kevin Coffey. I'm going to talk about the problem. Currently in the Gulf of Mexico, there are over 50,000 oil wells. 27,000 of those are permanently abandoned. That is our potential customer base for our product. Uh, the oldest of these, they started drilling in the 1940s in the Gulf of Mexico, so we can have oil wells that are as old as 70 years or more. And there are a lot of problems that can occur between when they were drilled or when they were abandoned and today, including repressurization, uh, faulty abandonment procedure, uh, poor seals, cracks, shrinkage in the concrete, all these can contribute to leaking. Currently, there is no regulation through government or industry in monitoring these abandoned oil wells for leakage. Here's a schematic of the damage. It basically shows just offshore you have your more shallow um, oil wells, and as you go through, through orange, green, blue, purple, they get deeper. And so you'll see the scope of our project. We can cover about 97% of this 20, these 27,000 abandoned oil wells. All right, so this problem requires a solution, the solution being uh, the ability to detect, detect crude oil leaking from the abandoned oil well uh, that, is, that is underground. So there's currently a, uh, an organization called BOEMRE, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulation and Enforcement. And they, they have set guidelines for the abandoning process, which are kind of uh, hazy. But there are also guidelines for, for what you can do to monitor that and what, what can go on. So in our research, we, we looked at that. And it actually has to pass a trawl test. So anything that's monitoring it has to be able to pass a test that where they drag a net over, the, over whatever is on, the, on the, the sea floor. And it has to not disturb the, the, the net cannot disturb the uh, the monitoring system, basically. It also has to be able to detect oil. And uh, we're looking at a three-month implementation period. So three months uh, is kind of a number we arrived at. We'd be able to tell at, by that point uh, what, whether or not it's leaking. Uh, we're looking at testing for about one minute out of every five minutes of, of, that, of those three months. And basically, the, the power consumption is, is our biggest problem and the biggest, uh, the biggest driving factor for, uh, for everything. So. We're, we're looking at changing from, from phase one. Phase one had a, uh, they were getting their power from a buoy system. And uh, due to that trawl test and some of the other regulations set up by the BOE MRE, that's just not feasible uh, to do in the Gulf of Mexico, at least. So uh, we're looking at being completely independent underwater uh, on the, the seafloor. So uh, we have to, uh, at first, you know, the biggest priority, oil detection. So we have to be able to, to determine if there's oil in the, uh, in the water or leaking from the abandoned oil well. Greg's going to tell you a little bit more about how, it's gonna, how we're going to do that. But this fluorometer made by uh, Turner Designs, it's called the Cyclops 7, it can uh, detect the, the quantity of oil up to 0.1 part per million. So it's very accurate. We actually have a demo set up out in the, the atrium. If you, you want to come see it, we've got a little shot glass full of uh, motor oil, which is not as, you know, like, uh, heavy as that doesn't have as heavy of a response as, as the crude oil that would be leaking from the oil, but you can still see the response, and you can see how the the fluorometer that we have out there responds to it and and, and measures the oil that's there. So it's pretty interesting, and also we'd include a, a pressure transducer as a backup. So for oil flow coming coming through, we the pressure transducer would uh, would test to see if the, there's a flow rate going through the the body. So I'm going to hand it over to Greg, and he's going to tell you a little bit more. Uh, good morning. My name is Greg. Um, so to get on the solution that we came up with, this is our final design. Uh, we went with a basic cone shape to help funnel everything to one spot where it's all going to be detected. Uh, and as you can kind of see right here, it's sitting above the mud line or the ocean floor if you want. 
Uh, all the abandoned oil well is going to be below it. There's actually nothing showing, so if you swam by it or went in a submarine, it would just look like any other part of the floor. Um, we find it because when you abandon it, they have to mark the GPS coordinate spot, and they are accurate to within like fractions of inches. So we're pretty sure we can find it. Um, we went with the pyramid shape, you know, easy to construct, it's simple, and as we mentioned about the trawl test, it has a, we can make it so it has a low profile, there's not, nothing that a net would catch on, and it can just sit there. Um, implementation. Uh, our vessel, we're hoping, you know, it's, what we design goes up to about 2,000 feet or 600 meters. Um, based upon all the, you know, statistics, that covers 90% of the oil wells in the Gulf of Mexico. That is a huge portion. Uh, that only leaves out the, huge, the very, very deep ones. Um, and to stay you know, under for three months long, which is a lot of power to run, uh, as you said, we're going to be only doing it one fifth of the time or one minute at, for every five minutes. We're using a microcontroller that will regulate. It will turn on and then turn off. And it will gather data and it will store up to 10,000 data points over the three month period, which that data can then be analyzed when we come, when, you know, bring it back up. Uh, here's a CAD model for our final design, uh, just to kind of explain it. As you can see, we have our cone shape here, and the purple dots are supposed to represent, you know, how oil could possibly flow. Anything that's going to come up, it has a very wide base. It is currently five feet by five feet. Uh, so any oil coming up, if it doesn't necessarily go straight up from the location, maybe it goes off a little to the side, it's expected to go straight up, but just to be safe and also to allow room for the pressure vessel and electronics, we made it larger. Uh, so five feet by five feet, the oil flows up, and we have a little ray here, which is basically the range of our sensor. So the oil is going to be forced to go past where our sensor is going to be detecting. So the chances of detecting it are going to be very high. Um, and that pretty much covers it. Uh, future work, we want to make sure we nail everything down, how it's going to be installed, uh, mounting procedure, e easy way to test it. Uh, we do want to eventually do a full scale test, drop it off into the ocean, make sure it withstands the pressure, uh, all the electronics will work full scale. Um, as Carlos also mentioned, you know, there's currently the proposal out, and that would give us more than enough money to do all this and hopefully some more. Uh, to make it an even better system. Special thanks to Harris, Carlos, uh, our faculty advisor, Dr. Illy, Silicon Labs, Turner Designs, AGO Environmental, and the Bureau of Ocean Engineering Management Regulation and Enforcement. Questions? Okay. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Johnson. Uh, thanks for showing up. Uh, we're here to present our project, which is, as you heard, the passive magnetic bearing for a wind turbine. I'll give you a background on the project. Uh, wind turbines operating in low wind speeds must overcome the frictional forces that they experience in their standard ball bearings. Um, so it was proposed that we design a passive magnetic bearing uh, for a Whisper 100 wind turbine, which is a commercially offered turbine. Um, now, a passive magnetic bearing requires no input. It uses permanent magnets to, uh, to work. It uh, doesn't, doesn't need anything else. Um, the goal of this, this bearing is to reduce the startup time when, um, when the wind speeds are low so that the turbine blades can start turning and power is generated. Uh, currently, at this point in time, there are no commercial offerings for a passive magnetic bearing for any application. The advantages of our design are threefold. First off, it gives you uh, more impressive specifications for a given turbine product. Uh, namely, it's got quicker startup time in a low wind environment. And as a result, you broaden the operational range of that turbine. <clears throat> uh, also, we're projecting extended component life due to reducing the friction uh, because there is no mechanical contact in the magnetic bearing. Uh, it also is maximizing the energy produced by reducing the frictional forces that it occurs um, when you have a regular ball bearing. Good morning, my name is Julian Cotto. And when we got our uh, specifications for the design, uh, we began doing a lot of different research and all the different methods that we could uh, uh, get this concept across and uh, have a successful project. So what we began with, as you can see here on the left, is uh, magnets with some sort of coil and a conducting center 
one with a Halbach array and one with just a normal uh, bipolar magnet. And we looked into those and we did a lot of research and we realized that we would run into an issue that although they would work, it doesn't function when it's not moving. So when the windmill suddenly stops, these wouldn't function very well. So we went into our uh, final design, which is using concentric magnets. This would uh, allow us to always have that uh, repulsion, so it's always working and always functioning at all the different wind speeds and even in static conditions. Um, how our uh, concentric magnet design works is it uses a series of ring magnets, as you can see oriented on the, on, on the table, which has that repulsion in the middle. As you can see, the two south poles and the two north poles are next to each other. That creates really high concentration of magnetic fields. And what this allows is that you also have the inner set of magnets doing the exact same thing, and it creates a repulsive gap with the magnetic field, creating a frictionless surface so that it can freely rotate and uh, reduce friction and produce more energy. On the far right, you can see is our constraints. We are constrained with a windmill that's already provided by UCF, and so we have to use the exact same space and the same size as the old original bearing that was first provided to us. Uh, we found a magnetostatic software to help us calculate how much force do we need, what do we need to work with, and to help the designer constraints to really produce a model. So the front load of the windmill is 17 pounds. We applied a 1.6 factor of safety in case of anything and for adding extra load and for extra conditions. So using the software, we were able to calculate about where we need to be for 27 pounds of uh, sustained weight, and that's with using a gap distance that you can see marked on the chart of 0.06 inches. And this would allow us to sustain all the weight and the load that we need to make a successful bearing. Good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Lind. I'm going to talk about how we uh, satisfied some of the constraints that Julian was just talking about. This is our ending design. It has two distinct, uh, two distinct uh, components, one inner race and one outer race. I'll talk a little bit about the materials used in each case. Our housings, as seen in the, uh, the picture up on the right, it's made out of aluminum. The housing is made out of aluminum. That makes it non-ferrous, so it doesn't interfere with our, magnet, our, our magnets at all. The, the things in yellow are the, the concentric magnets stacked in the orientation that Julian described. We also have the outer housing, also made, of, made out of aluminum. And these magnets are held in there by the, uh, by the retaining rings seen there. Um, system integration, uh, the, inner, the inner race is placed onto the hub, as you can see here. The hub comes standard with the wind turbine. Um, the outer race is slipped on over top of it. And the, uh, the, we used a thrust bearing on the back to stabilize it axially because the magnets alone couldn't stabilize it in the axial direction. Um, it is, there's a cutaway seen in the, the bottom right picture there. And the actual magnet that we built is in the bottom left picture here. Um, the way it's installed into the turbine is there is a sleeve that the, uh, the original ball bearings slipped into. And the, uh, the front weight of the turbine is bolted onto this hub. And uh, once you slip it in, it pretty much takes care of itself and it's ready for testing. Okay. Good morning, my name is Mark Benani. I'm gonna be talking about the testing procedure and the results that we obtained. Um, our testing procedure was performed in an, uh, an, an indoor environment. Um, we had two box fans set up um, that were oriented towards the wind turbine that provided constant wind speed. We measured, we also measured the power output over time. The, the startup time was measured until the, the windmill produced max, maximum wind power. And then after it produced maximum wind power, the fans were cut off and the time measured until it, it rested was measured as well. Okay, our results came out well. Um, the passive magnetic bearing um, resulted in a 13 percent reduction in startup time compared to the original passive magnetic bearing, which means that it, it produced power 13 percent quicker than the original bearing, which, which is what our design goal was, was to, um, to increase startup time um, in low wind speeds. And also it, incre um, it resulted in a 28 percent increase in settling time as well, which is a significant improvement over the original bearing. Good morning, my name is Talia Field. 
Um, based on our results, we can then help contribute to the improvement of the performance of these um, wind turbines. Now, this is a map of the general wind speeds of the country. Most of the high wind speeds are in the Midwest, and a lot of the wind farms are located in Texas for a main point. Um, with the application of these magnetic bearings, we can help widen the range of wind farm installation areas, as well as leak them out into the west and east coast. This would make the wind turbines located in the high uh, wind speed areas more efficient, as well as give them an opportunity to be placed in low wind speed areas as well. So in conclusion, we were able to help reduce the friction within the magnetic, within the bearings, um, helping increase the speed time, or shorten the speed time, so they get up to speed a lot faster, helping increase the amount of max power that you can create, that you can absorb, as well as uh, reduce the maintenance that would have that would be required from the surface contact of the ball bearings. We calculated a 7% increase in power just from the startup time alone, and uh, the settling time would help increase that accumulation of power as well. So uh, in between wind gusts and low wind speeds, when the speeds are alternating low to high, they'll, the wind turbine will continue to spin a lot easier and will be more sensitive to these low wind speeds. Uh, this design is theoretically scalable for other applications for potentially larger wind turbines as well as uh, applications outside of the wind power industry. So in conclusion, we have a unique design for a specific application within the wind industry. Um, we've been able to improve the performance life based on our results by increasing the startup power and um, have helped these wind turbines be more applicable to low wind speed areas as well as the potential for other applications as well. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Progress Energy, and our advisor, Dr. Go. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Zach Hamshin. I'm the project manager for Red Rising Engineering. And our senior design project was to develop a vertical takeoff and landing unmanned air vehicle. I know that's a long name, so we just call it a VTOL UAV. All right, so the motivation behind this project came from three different areas. Electric, vertical takeoff and landing, and unmanned air vehicles. All three of these areas have seen an increased interest over the past few years. So you see lots of vehicles that are being developed that include these ideas. So our project was to take all three of these ideas and put it into one vehicle. And Andrew's going to go over exactly the design that we went over. Hi, I'm Andrew Green. I'm the design engineer for Red Rising Engineering. For the design approach of our vehicle, we had to overcome specific design challenges. First, we have our power plant, the stability, composite materials, lift characteristics, and airframe. These are all just basic design characteristics when designing aircraft. We also have performance requirements. For VTOL, we must require a thrust ratio of greater than 1.1 or 1 to 1 to achieve a vertical lift and maintain that. And that is uh, created by uh, maximizing our static thrust and our lift. Stability is the next requirement that we have to uh, maintain because without stability we cannot maintain a hovering position in vertical flight. Then after that we have other requirements as well as considerations as far as flight time rigidity and maintainability. We want to be able to create an aircraft that will survive a long t period of time and then be able to fly for a period of time. The solutions that we came up with this was to create an aircraft using the lightest possible materials, composites and synthetics creating a small size for this project and selecting a high thrust power ratio uh, power system that would allow the most thrust out of the system for the power input into it. The placement of the center of gravity was also an important consideration because it adds to the stability of the aircraft so the thrust center is actually through the exact center of gravity when in the vertical position for flight. The power source, as Zach mentioned, we are using an electric power source to run this. And in the landing system, because we have to absorb a lot of shock when performing a vertical takeoff and landing was another consideration. Here we have an original concept design. As you notice, we have large swept wings because one of the goals of the project is after achieving a vertical lift, we want to transition from vertical to horizontal flight. So we want to achieve the maximum amount of lift with the slowest speeds possible which is given to the uh, wings, those designed. Um, 
it has changed a little bit from this, and I'll let Stephen take over and describe that. Hello, my name is Stephen Addison. I'm the process engineer for Red Rising Engineering. As you can see on the screen, we have uh, our current product, and it's still being manufactured phase. Uh, for the most part, the plane is the same. There's a few minor de details that you might notice, but they are minor, so we're not going to really go over them. Um, here's a diagram I'm going to use to explain to you the key components, and as you can see, our overall plane length is approximately four feet. Our payload bay is approximately almost a little, I mean, a little over a foot. And the structure you see in the center is our actual fan unit, which is a foot and a half long. In the fuselage, we have key, a few key components, which include the speed controller. It's a 160 amp speed controller. We have a very high amperage rate motor, so we needed a high amperage speed controller for that. We also have a three axis gyroscope system, which includes the gyroscope and a three axis accelerometer. That will be keeping our plane in level flight while we are doing a vertical flight. And it will be switched off for horizontal flight, where the pilot will take over full control of the aircraft. Here we have our power plant, which consists of the batteries, the electronic duct fan, and our Typhoon 840 kV DC motor. Uh, the, eight, the motor will be spinning at a maximum of about 45,000 RPM, while the electronic duct fan is going to put out a maximum of about 17 pounds of thrust. And that's going to be achieved at about 100 amps from the batteries. Um, the center structure that you saw earlier was a thrust vectoring assembly. And here you see, can see the back side of it. It has four fins on it, which are all independently controlled. And which is going to give us 3D control during uh, vertical and horizontal flight, which will be using the digital servos that you see on the left. Uh, and there are four locations, one for each fin. Here we have the structure of our current design. Um, we wanted to illustrate this to show you how, how we put it together, basically. It's mostly balsa wood. And as you can see, there are many carbon fiber spars to help the torquing between the booms because we don't have a central structure to our plane. To achieve vertical takeoff and landing, we had to do a bit of analysis. And as Andrew said before, we had to analyze the lift performances of our the lift characteristics and performance of our plane. As he said, we wanted to achieve lift at very low velocity so we could get stable flight very early in our forward transitioning. To do this, we also did dihedral wings, which gives us yaw stability, I mean, sorry, roll stability, uh, swept wings for yaw stability also. Uh, thrust to weight is important. Obviously, you have to have higher thrust than weight to achieve vertical flight. Thrust to energy is also something we looked at in the batteries, because we wanted to achieve the most thrust, longest flight time with the battery set that we were given in the motor matching. And at the last slide I showed you with the thrust vectoring is also a big analysis part, because we have to achieve, we have to be able to create the proper moments using those to control our aircraft during flight to keep it stable. To test this, we have recently done thrust analysis, um, which if any of you are interested, you can see a video at our booth of us testing it. And we did perform. Or we did achieve a high enough thrust to get the aircraft off the ground by itself. Thrust to energy, um, haven't run, done too much testing because we did a short test, so we're not really sure what our flight time is yet, but that, that'll be taking place very soon. And stability, we are currently tuning our PID controller or our stability gyro system to achieve, hopefully, a steady level hovering before we transition to forward flight. Here we have the energy analysis that I was talking about earlier. You can see five different distinctive lines, each one representing a different bracket of batteries. Um, the top one is a 45C discharge rate, which basically the different discharge rate indicates how fast your battery is discharging, how much amperage is coming out of it. The x-axis represents the milliamp hours, which is basically the capacity or how much can be stored in the battery. And using a calculator specific for uh, aircraft systems that are electric, we made curves to analyze what would be our best excess thrust, which of course is the thrust of the system minus the weight of the power plant and the maximum flight time. So using this graph, we chose the peak of the top teal colored line to be a 45C 3300 milliamp hour battery. And that's going to give us our best energy efficiency, basically. And with that, I'll pass it off to Michael Walston. Good morning, my name is Michael Walston. This is our testing criteria for success for our VTOL UAV. Um, the primary one is <laughs> vertical takeoff. We want it to take off vertically. 
The uh, second one is the ability to transition from the vertical flight into a horizontal flight as any normal airplane travels. And then third, we want it to be able to take off and land normally to, uh, to conserve battery. You can, if you wanted to conserve battery, you could take off or land horizontally like any normal airplane. And I'll give it to Mike Baker for the budget. Hello, my name is Michael Baker. Uh, I am the operations manager for Red Rising Engineering. Uh, as you can see here, we had a projected budget of $2,500. We managed to get within $15 of our budget. Um, our primary funding was uh, the MMAE department of UCF with $1,500 donated, and also a private sponsor based out of Mobile, Alabama with Baker Bites. Um, while this project is cool and all, in its own right, uh, there has to be a point behind all of this. Our, we do have uh, a specific market that we intend to reach. Uh, by achieving a platform as versatile as vertical takeoff, we, uh, we provide a very viable tool for our customers. Primarily, we have the military tactical uh, market. The US has spent five point four billion dollars in 2010 on unmanned vehicle technology, an increase in investment of 15 percent since 2009 and 35 percent since 2008. Uh, commercial market as hobby, RC companies, uh, sports networks for, for example. Civilian markets such as traffic surveillance, research, uh, fire search and rescue, uh, wildlife resources, etc. Um, and to compare the uh, products with uh, the other market, which is currently here, they, sorry, which is currently on the market right now, is Zachary Hamishin. So to kind of show some products that are already out there, to show that we actually are making something that is going to be useful, um, you can see two two over here that are currently already made or in production. The Aurora Flight Sciences Excalibur, that one that's currently in production, and that's very similar to the design that we have. You can see the centralized fan unit. The only difference is they have the fan units on the outside too for stability where we have the thrust vectoring vanes on the central fan unit. It's also a little bit bigger, and we couldn't find a, a price for it, so we're, we're assuming that it's also quite a bit more expensive. And then on the right, you see the Northrop Grumman MQ-8 fire, uh, fire Scout, and they took a little bit different approach for it, but it, they, again, they kind of want the same thing, to carry a payload and for, or surveillance and to be unmanned. Uh, it's a little slower because it is a helicopter-based one, but and you can also see the price is very expensive. So our goal was to keep the price down uh, to a more manageable budget. Uh, in closing, some future advances that we see for this uh, this project is to is main two things: to increase the battery life so that we can fly longer. And you can see that there's been there's a lot of research going into batteries. So if for, for a future project, you could increase the battery size or the, the technology for the batteries and increase the flight time. And the second area to increase is the payload. So adding things like sensors, cameras, or tactical ammunition. And we did have a camera on ours, so we did cover one of these areas. But there's also a lot of room for uh, expansion. So that's our project. If you have any more questions or you want to find out any more information, we're right outside. Uh, so come by and ask us. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Arnett. We are the uh, Smart Home. I'm working also with uh, Joseph Vantil and Brian Kruger. Uh, we were sponsored by uh, Workforce Central Florida, and our advisor was uh, Dr. Samuel Ritchie, and finally we were mentored by uh, Sean Donovan at Lockheed Martin. All right, so the motivation behind our project, uh, basically, as everyone, know, everyone knows, uh, energy costs continue to rise. Uh, energy independence, it's uh, definitely an important national issue. The only thing that we could really affect in our project would be energy conservation. And the, uh, the final motivation was with the advances in uh, mobile technologies, uh, people increasingly want more and more access uh, to all aspects of their lives uh, on the go. Now there are some similar technologies out there. Uh, there's a, uh, a project Jarvis and there's also a company called uh, Home Automation Incorporated. And uh, for our senior design project, we really uh, wanted to you know, create a project that could conserve energy and allow for remote access uh, to the project, as well as showcase our electrical and computer engineering skill sets that we've learned along the way. Now, just a little bit of information on energy consumption. Uh, in 2001, 
uh, families with uh, gross incomes below $50,000 spend an average of about 12% uh, of their after-tax income on energy. Now, by 2005, that number increased to 16%. And in 2012, uh, the Department of Energy actually projected it to be 21%. So we can obviously see that's a, some pretty significant increases. Now, there's this uh, chart here kind of shows the different categories of what people are using their uh, energy in the home. And if you, uh, you see on their home electronics and lighting, that's kind of the two uh, categories that we wanted to be able to reduce. And they add up to 16%, so some pretty significant numbers that we, uh, that, of categories that we wanted to uh, reduce. So as far as uh, the first component of our project, that's the uh, energy savings. And the way that we're trying to, to actually uh, do the energy savings is by shutting off unused uh, lights automatically by automatically sensing when a room is empty and turning those lights off. Now, the problem with a, a standard setup where you have a motion sensor in a room, basically uh, someone comes in, the light turns on, they're sitting on the couch, uh, they don't move, and then they all of a sudden find themselves in the dark. So the way that we got around this problem, we actually placed motion sensors uh, in each room and at each doorway. So if someone walks through a doorway, uh, the sensors in each room is, is going to look for motion. And they're going to detect if someone has left the room or entered the room. So this is going to prevent the lights uh, from turning off unless someone has actually left the room. Uh, and the convenience of this is going to allow someone to walk from one room to another without having to turn the lights uh, on and off as they enter and leave. And so this convenience combined with the energy savings is what we're going after in this first part. Good morning, my name is Joseph Van Seal. The second part of our project was to allow the user to access the home from anywhere. And we did that by embedding a server on a chip. This allows any, anyone with an internet connection to access their home and be able to change the status and view the status of any of the, the lights and outlets. Uh, what we use to do all this, uh, we use the TI MSP430, which is a small power efficient microprocessor, to have one in every single room, which would monitor all the motion sensors and control all the relays with the lights. The Stellaris was the microcontroller that allows the server on a chip capabilities, which we use to then communicate back and forth between the internet and the user and the MSP430s. And the NPION passive infrared sensors are what we use for all the sensing. This is an overall design of our system. You can see here the user will be able to access through any kind of computer, tablet, smartphone, the system over a wireless network router or any kind of internet connection, uh, which will then be connected to the Stellaris, which will handle all the communications between the two. The Stellaris will then pass things on to the MSP430, which is what controls all the outlets, relays, and everything of that. To get a little bit more into the, the motion sensors and how all those work, uh, we have this flowchart here. So here's, here's a simple setup where we have a door and two rooms, and the system will stay at equilibrium and not do anything until someone crosses over the door sensor. When that happens, it sends a signal to each of the adjoining processors in each room, and they'll start this uh, little flowchart over here. What they'll do is they'll turn the light on because something has happened in one of these two rooms, and now it's going to figure out what. So now it starts looking at the room sensors to determine, is there somebody in this room or not? If someone is found in a, about a 30 second window, it'll decide someone is here, it'll leave the lights on, and then return to sleep. If someone is not found, it'll determine if the room is empty, it'll turn off the lights, and then return to sleep. Uh, this is a prototype design that we came up with to demonstrate the, uh, the use of our uh, project. Uh, right here, we have one of the two ro three rooms. Uh, this little chip here is the microcontroller MSP430, which handles all the door logic and motion sensor. Uh, and over here is our brain, which is connected over to our router, which allows us to be accessed from anywhere. Good morning, everybody. I'm Brian Kruger, and I'm going to tell you more about the graphical user interface that the user is going to use to connect. So the GUI, once, it is, uh, once the system is turned on, the GUI actually is able to be connected to via an IP address. So the user can go and connect over a wireless network to the IP address and actually see the status of all the different devices. And I'll actually show you in a picture right here. So the user can go ahead and they'll see, when the system is on, they'll actually see status of all the different devices. 
and then they can go ahead and toggle the individual devices on or off depending on which they want, as well as uh, this, the lights and the electronics being uh, tripped on and off as the user moves in and uh, out of the different rooms. So looking more at a logic level view of how the remote access works, when the user goes and connects to the graphical user interface via the IP address, the Stellaris sends the information out to the user and it also uh, it goes and pings all the devices to find out status to see what devices are on or off. Once that's done, the system goes into a wait mode for the user to go ahead and either toggle a device or simply exit the system and uh, turn it off. That's about it for our project. Uh, we'd like to say in summary that uh, this was a very enjoyable project for all of us to work on. We really learned a lot and got to use the things that we were taught in school and put them into practice. And we also got to see a lot of the uh, business aspect to uh, going and implementing an engineering design. So we'd like to say special thanks to a Workforce Central Florida who helped fund our project and Sean Donovan who mentored us as well as Dr. Ritchie for guiding us and all his thoughtful insight and thank you for everybody else's help and support and for all of you for coming out today. <laughs>